So quantum random number generation is the topic for today. So this is something that Yayan and I have been working on for the last few years, and uh, it's been kind of a centerpiece for the uh, QIP research group at the University of Michigan. And right around the middle of last year, we started to have a critical mass of ideas and found, um, found some results. So uh, the, uh, the, the outcome of the work consists of several performance results for um, device-independent random number generation. But in the process of proving these results, we came up with some new techniques that we're hopeful we'll find applications elsewhere. So the main goal of this talk is to communicate the techniques. <coughs> so I'll start by uh, giving some background on quantum random number generation, uh, talk about what was already known before, and then um, talk about the uh, techniques we, that we use to get our results. And they split naturally into two categories. There's, so since we're doing device independence, we need to handle measurements and we need to handle states. And they're basically um, fairly independent techniques uh, for doing both. <coughs> and the main, uh, the main state of the talk is going to be uh, covering those two, those two parts. And then at the end, I'll talk about the relationship between our work and the work of Kai Min Chung, Yayun Shi, and Zhao Di Wu on randomness amplification, which is a closely related problem. And then I'll close with some uh, <coughs> open problems. OK, so to begin with the general scenario that we're looking at, this is a variant of the scenario that's appeared in a lot of talks uh, so far this week. And the basic idea is we have a classical user who wants to generate truly random numbers. So what she's looking for is um, a collection of numbers that is nearly uniformly random up to some negligible error and is unknown to any outside party. So we're setting the bar pretty high. And in addition to that, she's a strictly classical user and does not trust quantum operations at all. So we, we go all the way to the extreme in terms of, um, in terms of trust and say, um, this classical user, Alice, will not trust quantum operations unless she can somehow verify them through strictly classical means. And the basic way to do that is, um, her possessing a device split into multiple components. She does manipulations of the components so as to verify that what's going on inside of them is what it's supposed to be. And uh, we're imagining an adversarial scenario where there's um, a user who has inside knowledge about the behavior of the devices and may even have entanglement with those devices. And whatever protocol we come up with has to guard against any uh, adversarial strategies uh, by, that, uh, by that person. So here's a basic protocol for generating random numbers. And this comes from Roger Kolbeck's uh, thesis from 2006. The idea is that we exploit violations of Bell inequalities to get random numbers. Wait, what, what does that mean? <coughs> Are you assuming about the devices? Can the adversary send messages between the devices? What is the exactly? Oh, yeah, so that's a good question. So, so no, the adversary is not allowed to uh, communicate with the devices once the protocol has started. We do allow for the possibility that he can do arbitrary manipulations of the devices before the protocol begins. So he can establish entanglement. But once the protocol has started, there's no communication allowed with the adversary. Yep. Also, are, are, are you assuming quantum mechanics or no signaling? Or? We assume quantum mechanics. Yeah, and, and, and an interesting direction to explore is whether the same security proofs could be re reproduced just based on non-signaling. Any other questions about the setup? OK, so, uh, so the basic uh, protocol is this. So Alice generates some a small amount of initial randomness. Um, we assume that she has the ability to do that. And then she uses that initial randomness to play non-local games with this multi-part device. And during the non-local games, um, she shields one device from the other so that they can't communicate. And then if the boxes exhibit an average score at the non-local game that is impossible for a, cl a classical device, if it gets into the, the quantum realm, um, <coughs> then she concludes that the devices must be exhibiting some kind of quantum behavior. So she concludes that the outputs of the device are at least partially random. She applies a classical randomness extractor using some additional uh, self-generated randomness. <coughs> And then um, presumes that what comes out of that extractor is a collection of nearly uniformly random bits. So the effect is randomness expansion. A small collection of randomness transformed into a larger collection of randomness. 
So that was Kovacs' proposal. However, he didn't prove that it works. Um, so it remained an open question to actually give the necessary security proofs to show that an approach like this would work, and also to come up with protocols that optimize uh, this uh, approach. So a lot of papers um, over the last several years have appeared on this problem and also the closely related problem of device-independent quantum key distribution. Uh, there were uh, multiple ones that addressed the case of a, a unentangled adversary. So just assuming that um, nobody has entanglement with the boxes and trying to prove that the uh, outputs of the de uh, devices are uniformly random just from a classical uh, perspective. Um, so there were multiple papers that did that, and the rates gradually increased, in the, uh, and they got up to uh, exponential, an exponential rate from the uh, initial seed to the ultimate output. And then the first, and so as far as I know, the only um, truly quantum secure randomness expansion uh, protocol is due to Thomas and Umesh from uh, 2012. So they have an exponentially expanding uh, protocol that is secure even if the adversary is entangled with the devices. So when we learned about this result, the, um, the next frontier that we saw was uh, robustness. So this is an example of a non-robust result, meaning um, if a device performs perfectly at the, uh, say, the CHSH game or whatever non-local game you're uh, using, um, then it will uh, pass the protocol with probability approaching one. But if there is a constant rate of error, even if it's a small constant rate of error, it will um, uh, pass the protocol with probability approaching zero as the number of iterations increases. So the next frontier for us was looking for a protocol that will permit some uh, non-zero level of error in uh, the device used and will, um, in spite of this error, still be able to output nearly uniformly random bits at the end. <laughs> so um, first I'll say a little bit about why this seemed to us to be challenging. So the basic idea is we have some kind of um, non-local game. Let's say it's the CHSH game. And there's an optimal quantum score that we know of for this game. So in the case of CHSH, that's root 2 over 2. That's the best that a quantum uh, device can do. And then uh, there are results that say <coughs> that if the exhibited score, the average score uh, shown by a device over many iterations, converges to root 2 over 2 um, uh, as the number of iterations increases, then you can make strong conclusions about the behavior of the device. So for example, the multi-shot rigidity theorem of right shot Unger and Vazirani uh, allows us to say that if the uh, convergence occurs at a certain rate, then we can conclude that most of the time, the device is exhibiting near-perfect behavior, meaning it's doing um, the, the unique optimal quantum strategy in order to uh, produce its outputs. And that's not just over one iteration, but over multiple consecutive iterations. And uh, so in particular, that would imply that most of the time, the outputs are actually nearly uniformly random. And you don't even need to extract them. They're already uh, nearly uniformly uh, random. So, so the question is, what happens when we start to weaken the initial assumption? What happens if we allow root 2 over 2 minus c for some c? Uh, so if we allow uh, a constant level of error, then can we control what the device is actually uh, doing um, with this weaker assumption? And the reason I always found that difficult was because this allows for a constant amount of variation in both the state and the measurements of the device. And it's a little hard to predict how that's going to affect the ultimate results of uh, the protocol. So there are um, cases where we know how to handle this. So like in the unentangled case. So we can say, for example, that 
Um, say we set a slightly lower bar here. Say I take like root 2 over 2 minus 2c. And I say that a device is good if its expected performance at CSSH is above that level, and it's bad if it's below. So then the goal is to prove that good devices generate randomness. And bad devices tend to fail the protocol. So in the unentangled case, it's possible to set up an argument along those lines. So you can look at um, the tree of possible inputs and outputs to the device. So we look at the possible input outputs for the first round. There's some branching. And then outputs for the second round. There's more branching. And so basically in this tree, each path represents a certain input output sequence. And you can make claims along the lines of, uh, you can identify certain paths as being good and certain paths as being bad. The bad ones are where the average uh, expected score at CSSH is below that, uh, that level. And divide those up into two. And prove security based on um, that division. So there, it's a strictly classical argument, so classical security results will apply. On the other hand, if you have, say, quantum and you're in the uh, memoryless case, then you've got a case where you have your device, and it's entangled with our adversary, whom we're calling Charlie. And in the memoryless case, it's fairly simple. You don't need to worry about dependencies between inputs and outputs. And what you can do is you can identify a certain uh, subspace of Charlie's as being the good subspace. And then the complementary subspace is the bad subspace. And basically, if Charlie measures in some basis that's compatible with these subspaces, if he finds it in the good subspace, then the device is going to exhibit good behavior and he can prove security. Uh, and if uh, he finds it in the bad subspace, then the device is going to exhibit bad behavior and the probability of failing will tend to 1. So in both cases, you're OK. Where this gets really hard, at least from our perspective, is trying to put these two together somehow and trying to somehow juggle both the dependence on inputs and outputs and the, uh, the quantum environment. Because you know, just trying to take into account the fact that Charlie can measure along any basis, and then somehow trying to prove both of these conclusions at once. Uh, we always found it to be very difficult. So the ultimate result that we um, came up with was a slightly more indirect approach that basically sidestepped all this uh, complexity and just proved that the states that result from this protocol are random, even if we can't completely understand what they look like. So here are results. <clears throat> so we have an exponential randomness expansion protocol with full quantum security. And then the following features, which as far as we know are all new. Um, we have robustness. So there's a certain constant level of noise that can be tolerated by the protocol. And we have uh, cryptographic security. So this is a crucial property for any applications to cryptography. Um, if we're going to use bits in, cryptogra in, in a cryptographic application, we need to have the fact that the error term uh, vanishes at a super polynomial rate in the number of iterations of uh, the protocol. And a uh, nice uh, byproduct of our theory is that we can prove that as well. And then 
constant quantum memory. Um, since we don't, uh, we don't have to separate the uh, devices completely, we can allow them to communicate in between rounds. They only need to um, hold a constant amount of entanglement at any given time. And then a large class of games is allowed. CHSH is one, but there are many others for which the same level of security will apply. So out of this, we get um, some, uh, some nice results. So benefits of full quantum security, which have been observed before, um, are one, one is that we can get a quantum key distribution protocol. So in the quantum key distribution scenario, we have two parties communicating over an insecure channel. You need to be able to guard against the fact that uh, an adversary might eavesdrop and might entangle with their information. And we're able to do that. We're also able to do it with um, a small uh, initial seed. So we have a protocol that expands randomness and does QKD at the same time. And then in conjunction with Chung Chi Wu, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, later, we have um, some more results on composition. So we have a method for unbounded expansion from a constant number of devices. So the first result along these lines was proved by uh, Kudron and Yoon, and that's going to be talked about in the, in the next talk. And uh, we also have unbounded expansion from any single mid-entropy source. So not only can we expand from a uniformly random seed, but we can also expand from um, any source that is unpredictable. It doesn't need to be uh, uniformly random. And the constant number of devices. Uh, no, actually, and that's a good point. So, so one open avenue is to try to do this with a constant number of devices. Um, the Chung Shi Wu protocol has an expanding number of devices depending on what error term uh, you want. <coughs> So if you, if you set the error to be constant, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so that's the advertisement portion of the talk. Are there any questions at this point? Okay, so, um, so I'll talk about uh, the proof techniques. So the... Um, <coughs> The idea that I've kind of identified as the, the centerpiece of our results is this idea of forcing trust. And it's the idea, it's sort of, it's a change in perspective on security proofs that leads to um, some, the mathematics that actually enabled us to get these performance results. And the idea is we're no longer imagining that we are passively um, checking the behavior of the device in our protocol. What we're actually doing when we, when we use Colbex um, protocol or some variant of pro uh, Colbex protocol is that we are forcing partially trusted behavior from an untrusted device. So even though the behavior of individual components is completely untrusted, we're able to um, simulate the behavior of a device that is actually partially trusted. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So um, forcing trust is the, uh, the measurement side of our theory, and the other side is the, uh, the state side. So first we try to control the measurements, then we try to control the theory and uh, split it up that way. So here is an example of a randomness expansion protocol. And um, I got this from uh, a paper on classical security by Kujan, Vidic, and Yoon, and it's closely related to um, the Vazirani and Vidic protocol. And the basic idea is we are doing a Colbeck's approach to random number generation, but we're doing it in a conservative way. So we don't. Um, just play the CHSH game over and over again. Instead, what we do is sometimes we play the CHSH game, and sometimes we merely give the device a fixed input string. We just give it 0 and 0. So this classical controller receives a bit, and depending on the value of the bit, he either generates inputs, um, random inputs for the CHSH game, or he generates a fixed uh, string. And in the former case, he records whether or not the game is won. In the latter case, he merely takes the output of the first device and passes that along. So the result is we have a device group here that essentially accepts a single bit and returns another um, bit. And then um, in all these, all the randomness expansion protocols I've seen, there's always a final step where we uh, decide whether the, the uh, device has performed up to standard. So we check whether the uh, failure rate was low enough. Um, in this case, I guess, uh, it should be something like 
uh, one half minus root two over four or something like that, or, or a little, a little uh, possibly a little bit above that. Um, so yeah, one half minus root two over four plus c. And as long as it's below that level, we say the protocol succeeded. We've generated random numbers. Um, if it's above that level, then we say the protocol has not succeeded. We abort and we give no output. Okay, so this was known. So we take a, um, a slightly different perspective on what's going on in this, uh, in this protocol. So let's look at what this device group is doing, if we consider it just as one unit. So any classical process can be, oh, sorry, any quantum process can be considered as um, performing some kind of measurement on some kind of state. So in this case, what we have is we have two unknown binary measurements that are taking place in whatever state is inside these boxes. We don't know what the measurements are, and we also don't know what the state is, but we can still make some conclusions. So, so, you, so sorry. when you say two quantum devices, now... Oh, sorry, I, should, I, should, I meant to say um, a, a single device with two components. Where one is whatever happens when you give the input zero, that's one component, mm -hmm. and the other is whatever happens when um, yeah, so you could think of it that way. So you could think of this as one, um, one big device that accepts a zero or a one, and depending on that, performs one measurement or another. So there's, there's a measurement corresponding to one, which is the measurement corresponding to the CHSH game uh, play. So, so, so for example, that measurement includes you know, generate a pair of random inputs, feed them to the devices, devices do what they want, collect a pair of outputs, mm -hmm. and then check if the condition is satisfied or not, and that's actually your own. Yeah, exactly, yeah, that's what I had in mind, yeah. Yeah, so, so when, I, when I talk about this, this whole unit as performing a measurement, I'm including the playing of the CHSH game in that. Yeah, so there's a random choice, there's some individual measurements. Collectively, the effect of that is, is what I have in mind, yeah. And, and what is what now from the variables there? I mean, so, um, so what we're, so we're saying is, so this first component here is performing some kind of measurement on a quantum state, and I'm saying that measurement is represented by these operators here. Okay, so that's the, the box by the adversary, the one box is the left measurement. Yeah, right. So our, um, uh, yeah, the, the box is generated by the adversary, yeah. So this, this one corresponds to the box on the left, and this one corresponds to the box on the right. Okay. And then you have some box around that decides whether we do CHSH or just zero measurement. Yeah, so these, these classical controllers are what have the effect of that. So this is, so the, uh, the classical controller here does the procedure that was on the previous slide in, in terms of choosing whether to do CHSH or just generate um, a fixed pair and send it to the devices. So sorry, I think I was, I was confused then. MI is just what happens in the left green box. MI yeah, right. So this is yeah what happens in the left MI. green box, yeah. So MI is what is in the box. And one plus yeah. MI half is what? Oh, so yeah, 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 sure. No, no, I'm not distinguishing the two. I, I just meant N versus N. Yeah, yeah. So what I've written here so far just uh, addresses the individual components. Okay, so we have a mathematical way of writing out the, um, the individual measurements made by these uh, specific components. And then s uh, since this is a binary measurement, there's a very nice way we can write uh, what's going on here. And all of this I have to say is particular to binary measurements, and I don't know how to generalize it beyond that, although it would be an interesting avenue to explore. So um, if we choose an appropriate basis, and we may not know what the basis is, but that's okay. We know that under some basis, um, the, uh, the measurements performed on input zero and input one in, say, this device, this uh, component, um, can be written in this form. They just have a diagonal block form. And then there are some unknowns in the second measurement, which are unit length complex numbers, which I'm calling xj. So if you're familiar with Jordan's lemma, so the idea is we have um, two projections in a high dimensional space. And these numbers here measure the angles between those two uh, projections. And the xj is basically completely specified the measurement behavior of the first component. And then. Um, 
come, we can come up with a similar expression for uh, the measurements performed by the other component with a different uh, set of parameters. So then, now if we do what I was alluding to before, and look at this whole group of devices as a single device, um, and just look at it as something that is collectively accepting a single bit, measuring a state, and then producing an output. Then we can write down an expression for what the collective measurement actually looks like. So we have this bipartite system here. And then there's a binary POVM that's taking two possible binary POVMs that can take place on that uh, bipartite system. And we can write that out just in terms of the parameters x and y. So uh, the measurement that takes place on 0 will have blocks that look like this. All the entries are known. And then on input 1, the blocks will look like this. So the, um, the entries are not known, but we can constrain them based on what we know about xj and, uh, and yk. So here to write out this entry matrix, you're using the fact that this is the CHSA this is where this is. Yeah, right. Yeah, so that's where that comes in. Yeah. So so this is the part where we're factoring in, exactly, yeah, where we're factoring in the, uh, the effect of the CHSH game. So this classical controller here generates random numbers, gives them to these devices, and that shows up in this expression here. So basically, this arises from, uh, it is a uh, linear combination of tensor products of the original measurements that we were uh, looking at. So collectively, um, these two devices are performing a measurement on the bipartite system that is a sum of tensor products of the MIs and the NJs. And if we were to actually just write that out, then that's where this expression comes from. The, the shape of the matrix, yeah, that's not the end of the game. The shape of the matrix. Uh, Meaning the diagonal block form? Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, it's important that since we've gotten it down to this point, so the overall reverse diagonal structure um, is, is always the same, whatever game we're using here. Um, so the only thing that's particular to the CHSH game are the coefficients that appear here. But yeah, they all come from CHSH. OK, so now we can actually we can get something from this. So even though all these numbers are unknown, um, there are constraints on the possible values that are taking place here. So this can't be just any measurement. It has to be a measurement that can be expressed in this form where xj and yk are unit length complex numbers. And we can deduce something from that. We can show that the measurement a1 can always be decomposed into a, direct sum, uh, into a weighted sum of t and u, where t perfectly anti-commutes with the other measurement, a0. And proving that is just a matter of manipulations of complex numbers. So there's some fixed constant lambda, which just depends on the fact that we're using the CSS game. It doesn't depend on what strategy we're using. Uh, such that we can always break A1 down into these two components, where one of them is perfectly anti-commuting with the zero measurement. <coughs> so this is what I'm calling forcing trust. And here's why. The behavior of this collective device is that on A0, it does something trusted. And then on in, uh, input 1, it does one of three behaviors. Either it performs a perfectly anti-commuting measurement, one that perfectly anti-commutes with the 0 measurement, or it does something unknown, or it just outputs a random coin flip. So these options basically correspond to the sum ends in this expression. If I wanted to make it complete, I could add plus 0 times 1 minus root 2 over 2 to account for the coin flip part. So what the expression effectively represents is a random decision made by this device at each round, independent random decision, about which measurement uh, to perform. And the critical fact is that one of these measurements is um, a completely trusted measurement. It's one that gives a perfectly anti-commuting measurement with the, uh, the zero measurement. 
so far there's there's no assumption on this device actually passing the citrus API or not. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, so this is why I call this forcing trust, because it's not a matter of testing the device to see if it's doing what we want it to do. It's more like it's compelling the device to do what we want to do. And there's no test taking place. We don't pass it or fail it. We just say we do these measurements, and we know that there's a non-zero probability that it's going to do what it's supposed to do. Yep. Um, is this outputting a random coin flip? Um, are you saying it? you can further decompose this A1 operator into this random coin flip part, or are you adding it um, onto A1? So it, uh, it comes from the expression that we have there. So if I want to make the uh, expression a little bit more complete, I could add a term. <coughs> So what we could say is that a1 is equal to lambda times t plus root 2 over 2 minus lambda times u plus 1 minus root 2 over 2 times 0, let's say. And basically, this is saying that with probability 1 minus uh, root 2 over 2, the measurement performed is identity plus 0 over 2, identity minus 0 over 2. So just as t and u will determine measurement behaviors, so too does this, uh, this 0 over here determine a measurement behavior. And that measurement behavior is simply uh, leave the state alone and output a random coin flip. Mathematically, that's uh, what it comes down to. Um, if these devices inside are like totally bad and they say, say they always output zero, mm -hmm. uh, then you still say that we get random randomness out of them. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's a little tricky. So I would still say that, but the thing is, so this is it's a noisy simulation of a trusted measurement, and the fact is sometimes the noise is going to cancel out the trusted part. So if it were a case where the devices were just behaving deterministically. Um, this, this statement here would still be true, but the thing is this unknown measurement here could basically be canceling out the effect of the anti-commuting measure. But not of the random coin flip. So oh, you're um, saying there's still some yeah. randomness happening, but that can't be if, or, or I don't know where it would come from. Actually, there will always be, in this case, there will always be some randomness, because even if the devices are exhibiting, um, uh, even if they are, uh, individual components are exhibiting a deterministic strategy, there'll still be some randomness in whether or not they win the CHSH game. So say they always output a zero. That means that three quarters of the time they're going to win the CHSH game and one quarter. Oh, because there's lose. random input in the CHSH game. And where does yeah. that come from? Then that comes from the, the classical controller. Um, yeah, so the, uh, there is some randomness that's generated by that uh, so classical the controller there. Then I'm a bit confused what the overall goal is. I mean, we wanted to produce randomness, right? Right, right. A controller so that produces it already. Yeah, right. So, so this by itself doesn't necessarily show that we've successfully produced randomness. So there, there will be some more work um, that we'll need to do in order to do that. And that's when we start looking at actually testing the device. So the basic idea is we're, we're eventually going to need to start looking at cases where um, we need to show that the, um, this measurement here, when it's applied, tends to give um, a, uh, a biased outcome. And um, we use that, so when that takes place, then we know that, um, then we're able to conclude that some randomness is coming out of the protocol because uh, some anti-commuting measurements are, are being applied. I don't know what the device is that you construct in the end. Because it, now it sounds that you have a classical controller mm -hmm. that is trusted to produce randomness and you use this to in the end produce randomness. Right, right. Yeah, so, so the ultimate result is we come up with a protocol where there's a certain cost, there's a certain amount of randomness that's put in, and then there's a certain amount of randomness comes out, that comes out. And ultimately what we prove is more uh, randomness comes out than goes ah, in. Okay. So, so you it's, have it's constant stream input, mm -hmm. but then you can, for example, like, reuse some earlier output for later input, so? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that, no. But I would just say the, the total number of extractable bits that comes out at the end of the protocol is more than the amount that we put in. Okay. 
And it's true, it's, it's not something that's clear from this analysis that, that it takes some, it's some additional work. So this by itself doesn't necessarily show that we have randomness expansion. Um, but yeah, with some additional work, we're able to show that the cost of simulating this device is outweighed by the ultimate <coughs> benefit of the protocol. All right, so the ultimate result is we have untrusted devices, completely untrusted <coughs> devices, simulating partially trusted um, measurement devices. Okay, and so um, the, uh, the second part, I'll go through a little bit more uh, quickly. Um, but this is the part where we exploit the trusted measurements to get randomness from a, uh, an unknown state. And in this case, we don't know anything about, or we assume that we don't know anything about the state. We can only control the measurements, and we somehow have to get randomness uh, from that state. So I'm going to set up a new protocol, which is sort of a variant of the one we looked at before. And the basic idea is we now assume that Alice has the ability to perform um, completely trusted uh, measurements. Because we know we can at least do that in, in a noisy fashion. So we're going to go all the way and assume that she can do perfectly trusted measurements. And um, the state is unknown, and Alice will perform anti-commuting measurements on it while guarding against any possible eavesdropping uh, by an entangled adversary. And this is what I think is another one of the insights of uh, our project, in that we alter the, um, the style of the random number generation uh, protocols, in that we don't have an all or nothing abort or succeed uh, condition. So typically, you know, as, as we saw before at the end of a protocol, the user says, OK, the device is performed at this level. I will either succeed or I will abort. It's an all or nothing uh, condition. <coughs> And I always found that too difficult to work with in the analysis because there's this global event. At the end of the protocol, we have to condition on this global event. And it's very hard to predict how that's going to affect the, uh, the distribution of the device when we do that conditioning. <coughs> so we change it a little bit. Um, so assuming that Alice is um, making measurements on this unknown state and Charlie has um, there's a possibility for error, and there's a possibility of dis disguised adversarial behavior in that error. What Alice does is, um, so she's expecting, she, the prescribed behavior of the device is, it's supposed to have a state in it that will always give output zero when uh, the measurement zero slash one is performed. Um, so here we're imagining basically that there's a single qubit in the device that's being measured on either a plus minus basis or a zero one basis, because any anti-commuting case can be reduced to that. So the prescribed behavior is it's never supposed to give the output one, it's only supposed to give the output zero. And Alice runs the protocol using random coin flips to choose which measurements to do. And then if she ever gives an output, uh, gets an output of one, she won't give up on the device because that wouldn't be robust. What she does is she flips an additional coin and adds the results of that coin flip straight into the uh, output. And she considers that part of the same round. So this is, the, this is the output of the first round, the second round, and those two letters would be the output of the third round. And the result is that um, she, uh, so there's a certain amount of randomness going in and a certain amount of randomness going out. And we can compare the two. <coughs> and I'll just skim this part since I'm low on time. But basically, we have uncertainty principles which apply to situations like this. So there's a situation where we have some conditional behavior, con conditional additional behavior <coughs> by the classical user based on the outputs of the device. So when we look at that in, um, in terms <coughs> of collision entropy, this is a, an expression for collision entropy. Uh, the output of the protocol in a single iteration would be measured by this expression. Trace of rho plus squared plus rho minus squared plus rho zero squared plus one half times rho one squared. And the one half corresponds to the auxiliary coin flip that Alice does to uh, compensate when the, uh, the device exhibits the wrong behavior. 
And so we proved this, and I'm, I have not seen uncertainty principles so far in the literature that are in this form. I'm curious if anybody else has. Um, I've seen uh, tripartite uncertainty principles that address the uncertainty of anti-commuting measurements in a tripart setting. Um, but in this case, we have bipartite with a weighting uh, term. And, um, and we think that may be new. And there's probably a class of uh, principles like this that could be proven. So anyway, um, the results of that is, if we assume that for the moment that the adversary's system is completely mixed, then the uncertainty principle says we get 1 plus k bits per round. And then the number of bits going in, so this is the part I was referring to before where we balance the number of bits going in versus the number of bits coming out. Um, the number of bits going into the protocol depends on how noisy the device is. So if it fails with probability f at any given iteration, where a failure is outputting 1, uh, then the average number of bits is going to be 1 plus f per round. And provided that f is smaller than the constant k that showed up in our uncertainty principle, then we've achieved some randomness expansion. We've achieved a linear rate of randomness expansion. A little bit more comes out than, than goes in. So that's an initial step that's sort of just like the, the match that lights the fire. And then based on that, we evolve it into um, a more advanced uh, protocol. Change the distribution of the coins going in. Don't make them fair coin flips. Make them biased, because those are easy to, easier to generate with less cost. Change the measure of randomness. Instead of using collision entropy, use Rennie entropy. Instead of using exponent 2, use 1 plus q, where q is the bias of the uh, coins. And then basically just evolve from there until we get exponential randomness expansion from partially trusted measurements against an all-powerful adversary. And then the final step is completed by what we saw before, apply the simulation of untrusted uh, devices and partially trusted devices to conclude that the same protocol can be enacted using multiple completely untrusted quantum components. And then we have what we want. We have robust, exponential, quantum secure randomness expansion. OK. Um, so then I wanted to say a little bit about the randomness amplification problem that I alluded to um, earlier. So this is the, uh, the results of Chung, Shi, and uh, Wu, which was a companion paper to ours. So this addresses the case where Alice doesn't have the ability to flip random coins. All she has is a non-uniformly uh, non distributed um, initial source. And the question is, can we still get perfectly or near perfectly uh, uniformly random numbers coming out? <coughs> and the surprising answer is that we can. So even if the, both the source and the devices are imperfect, even if they both have um, uh, noise, you can still get near perfect uh, randomness coming in. And the basic gist of it is, um, we apply a classical randomness extractor to the non-uniform input, and we try out all possible Cs for that extractor. At least one of them, you know, actually several, but at least one will give a near uniform input, and then we run that uh, Miller sheet protocol in several copies on each of the inputs. And we know that at least one of them is going to work, and then we um, output the bitwise XOR of everything we get from those copies. So um, that's a simple diagram, but there's, there's a lot of, uh, um, there's a good deal of technical work and insight that, requ that is required to uh, prove that it works. OK, so, so yeah, so I think uh, it's polynomial many, many devices in the desired error, is that right? Uh, it depends on, uh, depends on a very important point <coughs> in quantum proof classical extractor about how short the seed could be. So, uh, yeah. But it's, it's a function that depends on the length of the input source and the error that you want to set. OK, so it depends on the particular extractor that you're using. 
Okay, uh, so that's basically it. I just wanted to mention a couple further directions that we're interested in. So one of these further directions is very focused, and the other one is very broad um, and ambitious. So the more focused one is questions about noise. So we've established that a certain amount of noise is permitted <coughs> in exponential randomness expansion. We'd like to know how much we can actually allow. And this is something that comes down to, it basically all just comes down to questions about complex numbers like we were looking at in the previous segment of the lecture. And um, I, I'm curious to see how calculations like this can be optimized. So basically it amounts to um, looking at that coefficient lambda that we had before for the CHSH gain. That is what I call the trust coefficient of the CHSH uh, gain. The bigger that is, the more noise is tolerated in the uh, protocol. The amount of noise tolerated is basically a linear function of that. So the larger we can make that, noise to more noise tolerance we get out. I calculated for the GHD gain that the trust coefficient is, is at least 0.14. And that tells us that the noise for GHD is at least, um, noise tolerance is at least 1.5%. Um, but all that's very preliminary and it's waiting for somebody to um, improve the calculations and optimize them. And then lastly, one final plug for Chang Shi Wu. They have a, um, a scheme for measuring the performance of arbitrary randomness amplification and randomness extraction um, procedures. And it basically gives us a direction uh, for the future. So the dream is to have randomness expansion protocols that maximize all of these things at once, or as many as we can at once. Security, quality, output length, um, arbitrary min entropy source, robustness, minimal quantum memory, device efficiency, and computational complexity. And that's it. Thank you. I guess you could express it that way, yeah. I mean, uh, so, so the question was, so given that in the, uh, ultimately what we're doing is, is that we have a tripartite case where we have a, a user with two device components and then a third person with an entangled system, um, is that, does that make it a uh, tripartite uncertainty principle? And um, yeah, I imagine it's possible that you could express it that way. I imagine it, it being a little bit more uh, complicated. But maybe, maybe by doing that, we could somehow relate it to the known uh, tripartite uncertainty principles. But just what, what I mean is the, the states, I mean, the states sh that show up in the uncertainty principle are actually like uh, unipartite in some sense. Like there's no tensor product decomposition in the states, but the, the bipartiteness comes from the game decomposition. I don't know if I put it that way. So I would, I would think of this, what we have here as an expression for a bipartite classical quantum state. So what we have is, we have the outputs of a single device, and then we have an entangled system, um, E. And basically, We've got four possible outputs. So we have a classical register on those outputs, and then we have a quantum register on the external environment. And the expression in the numerator there represents the entropy of that classical quantum state. So that's why I say it's bipartite. So it's bipartite. I mean, the two parts are the eavesdropper and the device. The device system is one part, and the eavesdropper system is the other part. Yeah, right, exactly. Okay. Have that question? And that's, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.